Hello and welcome to the Joint League Season 3 here on Heflet TV 1. Um, I'm pretty sure this is a best of one tiebreaker between Cleve and Northern Lions, although it might be best of two. We'll just have to see. I think this is just one game, however. As for casters, I'm Grandis V, and as usual, I'm going to be joined by Mike Loris. Now, there's a couple of cool things that go on with both tiebreakers and best of ones. First of all, tiebreakers means that these teams are pretty much by definition evenly matched, which is always pretty sweet. And then with best of ones, you could feel a little bit more comfortable pulling something just completely off the rails, trying to catch the opponents completely off guard, and then trying to ride that to a win. Of course, they could just go for vanilla standard, and that may be what they want to do. But Lycan's still in the pool, and Batrider's going to be the first pick for Cleave, along with a Skywrath Mage. Kind of an interesting start. I think this is going to be one of the games where you see Lycan completely ignored, or potentially banned out in the second phase. But I definitely wouldn't fault Northern Lions for picking up, and they go for the Pogna. Huh, they're going to go for all-in push, but in a different way. Um, the Pugna pick is very peculiar here. It's good up against the Skyrath Mage, sure. But then again, they don't have anything else to really synergize with it. Razor's timing for his pushing comes a little bit later. Um, I don't know. I, let's see how they're going to handle this. The Shadow Shaman is probably going to be banned out, and the Death Prophet's already taken away from them. But if Lycan's still available in the second picking stage, they might be able to get their hands onto that, as well as the Nature's Prophet. Um, they'd have to play the... Pugna as a support in that situation, or they'd only get one of the two. Um, either way. Yeah, it will be a very, very dangerous uh, combination, no matter what Northern Lions actually end up with. And unfortunately for Cleave, they themselves banned out the Tinker, which would have been a pretty decent hero to have. And it looks like Cleave, they're actually not too scared of the Death Ball. I mean, they already have the Bat Rider and the Skyrath Mage. If you get the Lasso on someone with the Skyrath Mage Ultimate on top, Odds are they're going to die. Like, Pugna is definitely going to die. And hopefully your Skyrath Mage doesn't have to deal with any Nether Ward from there on out. And Cleave, they do have heroes that are so far capable of making a substantial defense. They need a little bit more AoE, I think. They need something around the long lines of an Earthshaker would be a fantastic pickup for them just to uh, open up with a little bit more range stunning action that is guaranteed to hit. But just stuff like that in order to prepare for this Northern Lions aggression. Because when you pick up a Pugna this early, you definitely know that the enemy is... Or you definitely know that the team with the Pugna is going to be going for a super aggressive start. And Cleave, they have a good amount of early game control already. So I think they might just let them have the Lycan or Cleave. They might just pick it up themselves. That's also a possibility. Yeah, I suppose so. Earthshaker... Would be really nice for Cleve, but then again, it would be really nice for Northern Lions as well. Um, up against the Batrider, that's very useful. They're going to ban out the Vengeful Spirit, and I'm going to expect Earthshaker to be the pick for them here. Um, but then again, it could be something completely different. I'm not very used to seeing first pick Batrider. He kind of fell out of favor for quite some time. Um, yeah, it's still a really solid hero. Gives them a good offlaner, potentially mid hero. If they want to snag up the center, that's not bad either. Getting into the Pugna's face and just having another tool to initiate is never a bad thing. And then having the center ultimate plus Batrider lasso, you can pull whatever hero you lasso from pretty much across the map. Um, so that's pretty useful for Cleave, but I'm not sure how they're going to synergize um, their lineup here. As Batrider and Skyrath can go in pretty much any direction imaginable. Both of them are just pretty solid heroes all around. I actually really like the idea of Centaur in this matchup. As you said, getting in the Pugna's face is great, but also generally the weakness for these types of teams that just roam as five and just go for a push or go for an objective is that they usually are not the ones to initiate fights. They want to sit back and let the Nether Blast do its job. But if you have like five people or four people on the on your team in order to counter that with a lot of initiation, i.e. Batrider, Shaker, Centaur, those types of heroes, then Northern Lions all of a sudden aren't able to play their game. They're going to be trying to sit back and chip at the towers, but then suddenly Batrider, Centaur, blinking Earthshakers out of nowhere, and then they're forced into a fight, which is what they want to avoid. That's uh, pretty much the idea of their, of their death balls, that they want to kind of stall out in the towers and then slowly chip it down without giving Cleave any openings, but... Cleave, uh, now at this point with the Earthshaker pickup, I think they're more than prepared for this. Unless Northern Lions just go all out push, they just, you know, pick up five pushing heroes and just go for it. Which is a possibility, but uh, I think Cleave, they know what's coming. They definitely know what's coming, so they should be more or less prepared. Yeah, I would say so as well. Um, yeah, I still think Centaur is pretty good on their team. They still have the Scarth Mage, and I wouldn't be opposed to that. But then again, their next two cores. They could go for whatever they want. As for Northern Lions, they're looking for some supports here. All of the top tier supports have already been picked up or banned out. Um, 
the ones that they'd probably have their eyes set on, Shadow Shaman, Ventral Spirit, and Earthshaker are not available. Um, there really aren't any heroes that fill the same gap um, as, those, as those heroes, so you might be seeing something a little bit unconventional coming out from Northern Lions. A Shadow Demon would be okay up against the Batrider defensively as well as up against the Skyrath Mage. Um, and then they could combo something along with that, but they're just going to pick up the Tidehunter. I think this is your three cores for Northern Lions, so just going to snag up a pretty solid offlane. The counter initiation coming out from Ravage is pretty useful up against Batrider before he gets BKB, which usually isn't until pretty far into the game, and it's not a bad pick by any means. It's not going to synergize with the push entirely well, but then again, I'm not sure if it needs to. Yeah, the Tidehunter is a solid enough hero, though his laning phase in this game doesn't seem like it's going to be the most secure. If he's up against Batrider, if he's up against Shaker, or Skyrath Mage, one other, either way, he's going to be constantly under threat of dying, and that's not good for the death balling side. You want to have everyone on your team, at the very least, not die. That's uh, that's the goal, to have everyone live. So the Tidehunter is going to have a little bit of difficulty, I predict, especially if Cleave uh, pick up another hero to go in with this tri-lane, or, with the, or uh, just have the Batrider versus the Tidehunter matchup. Either of those scenarios will be really nice, and Cleave, wow! Okay, they're going to go with the Wind Ranger or Wind Runner, depending on what you like. But uh, yeah, this is a hero that we don't see all the time. It's actually a very rare hero nowadays, and it's at the very least a nice way to pull aggro. And again, if you're going to be starting fights, a two man shackle or a surprise shackle from a nice angle is a pretty decent way to do it. And if you miss, it's not a big deal, it's a, just a regular basic skill. Mm, I probably would have liked the Marana a little bit better here, as the Earthshaker, Skyrath Mage, Marana Tri-Lane might have worked out a little bit better for them. Um, this way they could still pick up another hero to go on the Tri-Lane and leave the Wind Ranger as a solo hero. What Wind Ranger offers that Marana doesn't is that little bit of extra pushing power coming out from Focus Fire, but usually that takes a little bit of time to get fully online, whether by just getting enough levels or by getting um, a decent amount of items to back that up. Wind Ranger, if you have a really good player, it's an awesome pick, but then again, uh, Wind Ranger is, like Marana, very hit or miss. If you hit the Shackles, it's awesome. If you don't, it's pretty meh. Rubik the pickup for Northern Lions, probably one of the best supports left in the pool. Um, still can't set up for some of your um, stuns that aren't as reliable uh, with that lift, and all around is pretty solid. Fissure, one of the best spells in the game to steal. And then Wind Ranger, pretty much anything that she can offer is pretty solid as well. Yeah, so for Northern Lions, though, they can go for a melee support, I think. Probably going something like along the lines of a Witch Doctor is probably what they're going to be angling to do, just because having more sustained for your push is never going to be a bad thing. And as far as supports are concerned, with a steady stream of sustain, it probably doesn't get any better than Witch Doctor, unless you want to go into like Omni Knight Abaddon territory or Tree and Protector, all three of which would actually work pretty well with what Northern Lions are trying to do. So I wouldn't be surprised to see one of those strength supports uh, being picked up from the Northern Lions side, but Cleave. I don't know, this Wind Ranger I think is seen so rarely nowadays that uh, every time you do see her, it's Reserve kind of hard to predict where she's going to end up in lane. It could very well be a solo mid lane Wind Ranger, and versus the Razor, it's not going to have the best matchup in the world, but uh, I don't know, it's, it's probably a little bit worse than Batrider. Maybe Cleave just want to put Wind Ranger in a tri lane and try to have a lot of kill potential, in which case, yeah, I think Marana is probably going to be a slightly better hero in that regard, but Wind Ranger, I guess, is as Windrun and she's hard to kill with physical damage so versus Razor it's a okay hero? I, I don't know. Wind Ranger is kind of a pretty large X factor in this game. Yeah, I don't know. This Wind Ranger it's is going to be interesting to see how they lane it. One of the biggest powers of the hero is being able to throw her into virtually any position. Maybe bar position 5 support but even then you can still get away with it pretty effectively. Um, I don't know, Cleave can go for pretty much whatever they want here as this last pickup, and that might solidify their lanes, but then again, the Wind Ranger and Batrider are more or less interchangeable um, as far as where they're going to go. I'm going to guess that that's a mid Batrider, and then the Wind Ranger's either going to be soloing top lane or being in the tri lane with Cleave. Um, but I have no idea. They, they could do whatever they want. 10 seconds is all we're going to have to wait before we find out what their pick is. Um, they're going to go for a Shadow Fiend. Now... Okay, so I think this is going to be a tri-lane Wind Ranger with Batrider offlane, and then Shadow Fiend just in the mid. So they're probably looking for that kill potential in the tri-lane, just going to sap all the focus away from the Shadow Fiend. Shadow Fiend definitely can work out here, and it's going to offer quite a bit of um, damage to their um, lineup all around, mostly in the physical department, which is where they're lacking uh, for the 
majority of the game. Um, yeah, Northern Lions, Rubik plus one definitely can roam onto a Shadow Fiend, but then again, they're going to be sacrificing a lot of Razor's survivability by doing so up against this tri-lane from Cleave. It can definitely work out. And ordinarily, I'm kind of on the fence for Shadow Fiend in general as a hero, but I think in this game, it will work out pretty well. Northern Lions, they don't have any way of getting right on top of the Shadow Fiend, and they don't have any real initiators until Tidehunter gets his Blink Dagger, and even then, you don't want him to just be starting the fights all the time with the Blink Ravage, because it's risky. Shadow Fiend is most likely going to have a lot of space to fight, and you know, even if he does go for a BKB, which is probably going to be the build, seeing as though it's a Shadow Fiend, he won't have to worry about too many people just getting up into his face. And that means when he's sitting off to the sidelines, he'll be raising and right-clicking away, and he'll be pretty happy. Northern Lions, their last support hero, it is not going to be one of the strength support heroes, which I thought would have worked out pretty well. Uh, Jakiro is going to be the pick for them, adding a little bit more to their pushing potential. So Pugna, Jakiro, going to be pushing up an absolute storm, and maybe later on, Ingman and the Razor is going to be contributing a little bit mo more with the Eye of the Storm. But I would say, in general, Cleave have a team comp that is prepared for this. So the only question is, how are they going to play it out? And is Northern Lions going to get away with their tower pushing? I would say if they get... Three tier one towers and a tier two, then Damn that's seconds. pretty much acceptable for Cleave. But if they lose all their out of towers, then Cleave are in some serious danger. Seconds. Yeah. Another one of the advantages of having a Wind Ranger on your team over the Marana is her ability to clear waves with Power Shot, and something I overlooked in the draft. But either way, in the game we go, and let's see how this is going to pan out, is we're going to have Northern Lions playing on the Radiant side with Phantom XP taking up the Pugna, Evasion on the Jakiro. Um, Mm, CWYT on the Rubik. I'm pretty sure that's Relic, and sorry about that. Ingman going to be playing on the Razor, and offlane, we're going to have a Tide Hunter handled by Tides Boys. I just like to quickly point out how awesome the Radiant Courier is with his gems and everything, so I, I enjoyed that. Okay, on the Cleave side, we got Stress playing the Shadow Fiend. Hacken, I believe it is, on the Bat Rider. Metspum. I'm Metrum. pretty sure that's. What is that? I think it's Metrum. Oh my goodness, I could be wrong, but. I have no idea. This guy's playing the Earthshaker with Roger playing the Wind Ranger, and Vaxa is on the Skyrath Mage, and they're going to run into Tides Boys, who I don't know if he changed his name after he knew he was going to play the Tide Hunter, but that's surprisingly fitting. Yeah, <laughs> I like it too. I, I think it is pretty likely that he changed his name. I'm not sure who that actually is, um, but yeah, even if he did, I, I like this change. Many style points for you. All right, so looks like it is just going to be a bottom lane with the Pugna. Uh, oh, no, it's at a bottom lane with the Razor, actually. Pugna's going to be going towards mid against the Shadow Fiend. Uh, I mean, Pugna has some pretty decent base damage to start off with, so he is capable of stealing the last hits out from the Shadow Fiend, but I don't really know if Pugna is the right hero against Shadow Fiend. Pugna is a hero that does do very well in clearing the creeps and just starts chipping the tower very early. But Shadow Fiend with one and two raises is going to instantly clear creep waves. So though Pugna will be able to sneak a blast in here and there, it's not really the best way to push this lane slowly. He's going to get solo lane experience, which I guess is really nice. But uh, I don't know. I think I'd rather see the Razor in this lane and Pugna going down bottom and trying to get a nice start for the Pugna as far as gold is concerned. Yeah, same. I think that Razor would have fared better. The uh, top lane is going to be Tidehunter versus Batrider and Skyrath Mage. I'm not sure if keeping the Skyrath here is going to be to their benefit. Having just the Earthshaker and Wind Ranger down in bottom, they don't have the greatest killing potential. I mean, sure, if they land a really nice Shackle, it could still happen, but I doubt they will be able to do so. And actually, the Earthshaker caught out a little bit. He's going to be lifted back in the Razor. Now the follow-up Ice Path is going to be perfectly on the mark. I think this is a dead Earthshaker. He is going to land the Shackle onto two, and that will secure his retreat, although the Earthshaker caught out in a very awkward situation there. Yeah, he went really deep in order to place an Observer Ward to keep tabs and block off the pull camp, which is kind of worth it, and I, I would say since he survived, it is totally worth it. Wind Ranger coming in big with level 1 Shackle. That's usually not what you see from the hero. It's a level 1 Wind Run or Power Shot, depending on how much he needs it, but I didn't keep track of Roger's skill point, but either way, I'm going to assume he held it and recognize the fact that Shackle Shot is going to let my ally escape, so that's really what you have to do with Wind Ranger, and she is pretty much going to be online. Once she hits that level 9 mark, max out Shackle Shot, max out Power Shot, one point in Wind Run. It's a pretty standard Wind Ranger build. So she, with this dual lane, is actually going to be faring pretty decently. There is a lot of kill potential down in this bottom lane, especially if she gets lifted into an Ice Path. But aside from that, if she is able to dodge lots of the right clicks coming out from the Amplified Razor damage, then Wind Ranger should be pretty happy. She's going to be getting a lot of experience down here, and really that's all Wind Ranger needs. 
Yep. Without support rotations, I expect the kill potential to be all down this bottom lane. As Rubik looking for the die, he's going to take a lot of damage from those wolves and probably be forced to eat through a lot of his regeneration. Um, but I suppose he got the deny. Maybe worth it? I don't know. Uh, Shadow Fiend, he um, does not have his bottle just yet. He's doing decently well up against this Pugna. 6 and 5 on your Shadow Fiend. He's pretty much gotten over the hump um, that Shadow Fiend faces at the earlier levels and now is hitting with a very respectable amount of base damage. Um, or amount of damage, rather. Um, yeah, Titundra up top, he's getting some pretty good experience. The Skyrath Mage is running about with Arcane Bolts, and that's about all that he can do. Um, I don't expect this Tide to die, unless he just oversteps his bounds and gets sticky too much. The bottom lane is pushing out. My Fissures are invisible on my screen, which is unfortunate, as they lift up Metrum back into the Ice Path, as well as Plasma Field to right click. So they're going to be there, they will. Evasion drawing first blood, and that's a kill potential in this bottom lane. Yeah, they were playing it a little bit passive. I mean, the first attempt on the Earthshaker was mostly because Earthshaker decided to take a trip around to the enemy side of the map. But yeah, just jumping in for the Earthshaker really quickly. And with that burst damage from these three heroes, though it's not the deadliest tri lane by any means, like there are definitely deadlier tri lanes out there. This is certainly capable to kill off the likes of a dual lane because these two heroes have to be covering each other. Earthshaker can certainly cover the Wind Ranger, but really not the other way around unless Wind Ranger has a perfect angle, and those are kind of hard to come by. So, this bottom lane for Cleave, though it is going still pretty well for them, it that just has to make sure to not die too much. You never want to give the deathballing team any additional kills or any sort of advantage. Really, for Cleave, the objective is going to be to not die, and really for both sides, the objective is going to be to not die. And then in like five, ten minutes the real action is going to start happening. And then, at that point, it's going to be who has better fights. And with Tidehunter having a pretty decent time up top, it's hard to say that end lines are not going to come out on top once they have that Ravage. It's a devastating tool that Cleave are going to have to out-initiate end lines in order to kind of avoid. Yeah, and lasting him back in your team usually isn't an option for Tidehunter. Well, cracking it off, and I don't know, even with the Skyrath Mage Ultimate, he still has a chance to get out of there, especially with support back up. We are going to see um, Shadowfiend continuing to farm away, um, but yeah, this Blink Dagger on the Batrider is going to be crucial for them. It's going to come out at a nice time, as the Tidehunter isn't able to put much pressure on the Batrider in return, um, even though he is having a nice time in lane. We are still going to see Hakan getting himself a very fast Blink. He's about halfway there now, and I'd expect that to come out in about 7 minutes as to go down in bottom. They're going to link up Roger. I don't think he's going to die. He'll be able to run back under his tower, and he'll be fine, um, despite losing a little bit of damage. Yeah, Tidehunter up on top is actually having a very good time. He has a matchup against two heroes that typically do spam their skills a whole lot, the Arcane Bolts as well as the Sticky Napalm, so his magic stick is pretty much working overtime, and that means he's going to have more anchor smashes, he's going to feel more comfortable moving up, and bottom lane, they're going to go again for the Wind Ranger, but again, Wind Run is going to keep her safe. However, she is taking quite a bit of damage, didn't get the Wind Run out to uh, dodge Liquid Fire, so that's kind of unfortunate for her. The Earthshaker now is keeping her safe, and this is pretty much what the lane is supposed to work with in this uh, 2v3 matchup, but they can only do it for so long because Earthshaker is running low on mana, so Roger's got to be careful. I think this might actually just be him having to go to the base soon, and that means that in a 3v1 lane versus the Shaker, this tower is not going to last very long. They're just going to go for it. Ingman, unfortunately, can't really push this tower that fast. It's a Razor, and it's not a Pugna, so this tower is going to survive for quite a long time, and we take a quick look at the mid lane. Phantom has not laid a single blast on this tower yet, so... This Pugna is getting experience and getting a decent amount of gold, yes, but his pushing, it's not really there. You would expect him to be chipping by now. Yeah, I don't know, it's just easy double raise to keep that at arm's length so that the Pugna isn't able to uh, sustain those pushes. Um, but yeah, Scarth Mage, he's started stacking up, or it looks like that he's going to start stacking up for the Shadow Fiend. It's definitely a worthy use of his time, but this Tidehunter is going to find himself an unimpeded level 6 after destroying that Catapult. Um, so yeah, Tidehunter now has his TP Ravage available as they potentially will go on bottom. Um, right now the supports are in mid and potentially looking for the Shadow Fiend. Although he's backed off, he is going to walk into lane right into the lift from the Rubik. They're going to follow up with the Ice Path. He walks right into it. It's not a very long range Ice Path and now they're going to turn onto the Jakira. They're taking a lot of damage. The Pugna Blast that's decrypified up will bring down the Shadow Fiend. One more auto attack gives Phantom XP a double kill. Didn't think that uphill attack would have been enough to get the Jakira, but in the end I'm wrong. Is up in top. Tides Boys might be able to turn onto Hakan. He does have a Ravage here. One Anchor Smash or Ravage is all that he needs if he wants to really commit to this kill. He is burning in the fire and the flames, but he's going to be fine and reserves his spell, which is probably the more responsible choice. So, Nether Ward, it's level 1, and usually Nether Ward is, everyone talks about it, oh, it's, it does a lot of damage, it punishes Skyrath Mage, stuff like that, but in that scenario, Earthshaker teleported in with just enough mana for a fissure, 
And then he lost that mana because of a level 1 Netherward, and he couldn't save his Skyrath Mage buddy. So, Netherward level 1 with the Mana Drain, proving to be very effective against the low mana heroes like Earthshaker. It's going to be a rarity. That's not going to happen all the time. In fact, that's probably the first time in a very long time I've seen the Mana Drain be relevant ever. But they're going to go for Hacken up on top, and with the Ravage being committed, just a beatdown to follow. And Lions, they're looking so very good. They haven't, have, they haven't even started their push yet. Once they do actually start that, then it's going to get really terrifying for Cleave. Yeah, Pugna, he's saving his gold. Let's see, what is he going to be going for? I think he's going to be building the mech, and it looks like he will as Razor backs off for the phase boots. Phantom XP, uh, it's kind of weird to see uh, Pugna sit on this much gold rather than buying the two components, but he'll have those whenever he wants to have them, and we'll have the completed mech short after. Um, so once they have that tool available, and once they have the Ravage cooldown in about 100 seconds or so, I think they'll just start 5 manning down the towers, and it's up to Cleave to make something happen. Um... And to stop that, Batrider's still not getting his Blink Dagger. I thought he would, but then that death up top, it's actually a pretty significant one since he was pooling so much gold towards it. He's going to farm up one stack of uh, large camps, and then he finds Mud Golem. So very unfortunate for a con. Um, but yeah, we're just waiting for Cleave to get those basic items online. The Shadow Fiend has very little to nothing. He has a bottle as well as Power Treads, and that's it. Unfortunately, the starting phase for Cleave, it looked fine in their lanes. But now just dropping so many kills, suddenly the laning situation looks a lot, lot worse. As you said, Batrider getting slowed down just that little bit due to his death, and that's a death versus the Tidehunter, where it probably shouldn't have happened. They're now going to go once again onto the Skyrath Mage up on top, but with no Ravage to commit here, I don't think they could actually get the Skyrath Mage, but hey, they don't really invest that much, and they bring him down very, very low on Hacken. He's still feeling pretty comfortable in this lane, but I don't know if he really should. If he gets caught with a Gush and level 4 Anchor Smashes, that damage is really slowly going to start to stack up. Honest Bat Rider, and he can't afford to die again. Like, he needs to get his Blink Dagger and then go ahead, die as many times as you want, but until then, this guy needs to stay alive. And if he doesn't, then Cleave really have no shot at taking this, the fights once the push from End Lions actually comes about. Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. We have a Rubik sitting mid, but he's not smoked up, and he is spotted out by a ward from the Dire. So, Jedifine shouldn't get caught out by this, but they should be able to put a little bit more pressure than they usually have to these stars. With the maxed out Nether Blast, um... I don't know, Shadow Fiend does clean up two of the creeps, so now with the Rubik inbound, they can at least blast a tower once or twice, but they still haven't been able to do so. I think one auto attack from the Pugna, that's all that's landed on that tower, and, well, that's not very significant at all. The Wind Ranger getting close to um, hitting her stride here. She does have the maxed out power shot as well as two points in this shackle. They do have some killing potential if they land it, but then again, not unless they harass them first, and shackling the Razor is... Pretty difficult, let's see. Rogers is going to need a plasma field and then bottle back up. Um, still haven't seen the power of the Wind Ranger with the Up. exception of... Oh, yep. Up there, going to go for Tide's boys. He gets the Kraken Shell out, but... And then the Stick Charge. I don't think it's going to be enough. Uh, one more Arcane Bolt. Slowly but surely, Tide boys, dead. Just a nice... Uh, the Tide Hunter actually getting a little bit too over-aggressive was underneath the tower and then got lassoed. Yep. Fair enough. Usually Tide Hunter is one of the targets that you don't want to lasso, but in that situation it's completely fine, especially since he's not sitting on that much HP. A double fissure comes out from the Earthshaker, but no follow-up shackle. They're not going to be able to make anything of it. Yeah, it's just kind of a stall as we're waiting for the items to come out. Blink Dagger on your Tide Hunter as well as Batrider, as well as the um, Razor to pick up anything. Presumably Drums is his next item. Uh, yeah, you could either go for that, or you could just start straight up rushing your Aghanim Scepter right after this. He's gonna pick up a Bracer, so it's going to be Drums, as you said, and then hopefully next item after that is going to be an Aghanims to hopefully get a little bit more pushing power onto these towers, because end lines, their laning phase is going perfectly fine. Soon they're going to want to start deathballing, and the Tide Hunter has his Ravage, doesn't have anywhere close to his Blink. I don't know if they would really want to wait for a Blink Tide Hunter. It seems like it'll take just a little bit too long. Maybe they're just okay with just the status quo. Phantom does have his mech up, and the Razor is farming okay as well. So if two of your cores are farming this well and the en enemies aren't, then I don't see any re huge reason to move out as evasion, though. In the bottom lane, Fissure into sustained damage from Skyrath Mage. No Mystic Flare needed. Gonna give a give up a kill on the bottom lane. I think it's about time for end lines to stop this quote-unquote laning phase and try to go for some tower pushes. Uh, I think that's fair. Tower potentially denied in bottom lane. Let's see Earthshaker. Will it be able to punch it? He's going to stun up the Razor, but then it's going to be snagged by that Catapult. Need to wait a little bit more before punching there. Decent attempt, but the Shadow Fiend dies in mid. I'm not sure what happened there. Was that just Rubik lift into Pugna damage? Yeah, Pugna ran forward with a haste rune, decrept him, and then Pugna 
off of that like little bit of delay, got in there with the telekinesis, and then Pugna started draining, and then it was just all over for the Shadow Fiend. There's not really any way to escape that much damage early on. And well, off of that, that is going to be the trigger for End Lions. Now, now they're going to pull the trigger up on top, and they're going to have to deal with Wind Ranger power shots. But I think their goal is going to be this Tier One tower, and I'm pretty sure they're not going to stop. If the Tide Hunter survives this engagement or this attempt, then he'll most likely have his Blink Dagger. And then End Lions are sitting pretty, but they do spot out Hacken, who's looking off to the side. He gets with the Ravage and the Anchor Smash. He's going to get first down, Hunter to zero. Just with Tide Hunter Rubik, stolen level four power shot is a good skill to steal. And now without the Batrider, Cleave, I don't think they could defend this. Wind Ranger has to get out, but can she get out? That's the question. She's going to get gushed up. Fissure is there to back her up, but it's not going to be casted just yet. There it is on Phantom. But yeah, now the tower is just screwed. Phantom's going to take a power shot and a lot of damage, actually. But he does have a bottle as well as a mech, which he will, in fact, pop. This tower is gone, and end lions, they don't have a Ravage, so they probably don't want to go for much more, especially when the Batrider down. But I think they're going to probably look to go towards mid lane or try to get some other objective off of this. Yeah, I think you just go straight forward to the other towers. I was considering maybe Tidehunter just going for a straight up pipe. Um, instead of working towards the Blink Dagger instead, but Blink Ravage, you can't really fault him for the choice either. I think just getting the early pipe would be very useful for his team, as they're probably going to want to push high ground sooner rather than later. Razor late game versus a Shadow Fiend as well as Wind Ranger. Yeah, it, it could go either way, it just depends on how much money they have. As they jump in mid, they're going to last one, but can't move him everybody, but it doesn't matter because the Skyrath Mage Mystic Flare is going to be there. Killing spree for him, as now they jump onto Stress. Stress is being bursted down pretty effectively here, and now he's going to be lifted up with the Pugna Drain going off. That's going to be killing the Shadow Fiend, traded for the Razor. Now this tier 1 tower in mid, probably going to fall very shortly. Um, so despite losing a Razor to start that off, I think that Northern Lions are going to be completely fine with that. As without a Batrider Lasso to scare them off, I don't think that there's anything to really deter them from taking this tower. The Shadow Fiend is a lot more important for Cleave than the Razor is for End Lions, especially with pushing these towers, because Cleave, they need the clearing with the Razors, they need that range hero in order to do that. End Lions, they don't really need the Razor to fight. They're perfectly fine right now, which is the base values and the fact that they have a lot of spells that they can cast that do a lot of damage. and. They're going to easily chip down the tower and cleave. They have to sacrifice yet another tier 1. That's going to be all the tier 1s thus far. And end lions, uh, I don't really know when they're going to be going for tier 2s. But for now, they're going to go for the Earthshaker. Vizier will keep him safe for now. And Tide Boys, this is kind of on an awkward side of it. But he will find his way out of there. Hacken doesn't have a lasso just yet. But he's definitely looking for some sort of fight right now. Cleave, they do have the Shadow Fiend back. And really, the Shadow Fiend can't afford to be caught out of position like that. He was caught at a very strange angle with the enemies coming from his north, which you really wouldn't expect. But if Shadow Fiend keeps on getting caught out like that, then it's just going to be an easy win for End Lions. He needs to stay in the back. He needs to make sure that he only fights off of Batrider initiations and he himself doesn't get initiated upon. It's a lot more difficult now that the Tide Hunter has his Blink Dagger. So it will be a tier two bottom push and Tide Boys off to the side with the Ravage and backup. That's going to be one tier two down and they got it so easily that they might just want to go for another. Yeah, I think there's nothing really stopping them. Inside the draft, you said this was the acceptable loss for them, but honestly, I'm not so sure. As Stress, he's working towards his BKB. He'd really like to be a lot closer, but despite him farming well, he's died three times. So Stress is not very close at all. And, well, I guess it's a decent time to take a look at the graphs after it's updated after that last tower. We're looking at about an 8,000 lead in gold, and the experience lead is 2,000, both in the favor of Northern Lions. Smoke up top looking for somebody, but they are going to find nobody. Ingwin, if he showed his face, he'd probably die to the similar combo we saw mid. Um, but the rest of Northern Lions are pushing out mid, now they blink onto the poor Earthshaker. The Ice Path is going to be off the mark, but he's still taking too much damage here. The Pungan Blast is going to be enough, as Phantom XP notches himself a killing spree. The tier 2 tower in mid, they're... Probably not going to defend this very effectively. They need to start TPing back if they want to go for that. And they're going to go for the Razor instead. And the TPs are going to come back to help him out. England, he's still surviving on the back lines. They dropped the Ravage. It's only going to catch out Batrider. And Batrider is going to fall because of it. Flame Break stolen by the Rubik. Looking to cancel out TP. It is going to cancel from long range. Stress is now caught out in a very awkward situation. He's channeling his ultimate. It's going to do a lot of damage to the Tide Hunter, but it's not enough. And the Death Requiem will secure the kill on the Tide Hunter, but they still lose their Shadow Fiend. And without a Ravage, Tide Hunter doesn't actually care about dying that much. Man, that's just not a good exchange for Cleave. They wasted so much time trying to go for Ingman. Even if the Shadow Fiend survived, I would have said that's probably not a good trade for them. They need to make sure that every single time they use the lasso, they get something off of it. And End Lions, I guess they did all teleport up there, so that's a lot of gold that End Lions are not going to have in the future, wasting all that on TP scrolls. But they're so wealthy because of the tower kills that they're kind of okay with doing that, especially if they could turn it around and get two kills off of it. 
Cleave, they are just like buying a little bit of time with their gank attempts, which ordinarily would be great if they are successful. But not having successful ganks and just wasting your ultimates in that fashion means that N-Lions now have a pretty nice door where they could go for these final two tier 2 towers. They have a pretty comfortable kill lead, which is not something you would expect from this type of pushing comp, seeing as though when you do draft heroes like this, generally your lanes tend to be a little bit weaker. But the lanes have done just fine for N-Lions, so their lanes are, are fine. Their pushing is now online, and Cleave have been slowed down so much by all these unnecessary and fruitless dives that they are going to really struggle against this push. It's going to be four heroes on end lines, five with the Rubik teleporting in, and now he himself has a Blink Dagger. This is such an early Blink Dagger for Rubik that I don't know if Cleave are going to be prepared for this, just because, first of all, it will be a surprise, but also more Blink Daggers means more heroes getting right on top of your Shadow Fiend and your Earthshaker, and heroes that really want to not be in the middle of everything and want to get their spells off from a safe distance. So it should be the chip game on the middle lane, and it should be very easy to pick up for end lines. And then why not go top and do the exact same thing? I don't see a compelling reason. Looks like they're going to look for the deny. It's not going to come out as Razor picks the last hit. Roger is going to avoid the ice path, but this Wind Ranger has done very little at all this game. She landed one shackle, which is nice to keep the Earthshaker alive for a little bit, but honestly, I'm not a huge fan of how Cleave decided to lane this. I was kind of hoping for them to just go aggressive with the Skyrath Mage. As nice as it was that he stacked up some camps um, for them to take, it just didn't really do much. I think having the Skyrath Mage there would have allowed them to get kills a little bit more effectively. Stress finds himself a tier 1 tower up top and then TPs back to the rest of his team. He'll be fine, but we're still waiting on the BKB on the Shadow Fiend. In this game, it's not an end-all be-all item for him. Um, I don't know, you can still get focused down by the Razor and he's not going to be hitting hard enough to really comfortably sit in the middle of the entire fight and man fight up against what Northern Lions bring to the table. It will negate a lot of what Northern Lions have, but he can't 1v5 just yet. And it's also dependent on him actually popping that item. With the Blink Rubik, it's going to be a lot more difficult for Shadow Fiend to get his BKB off before the fight even starts. And if the Rubik does Blink in and force the Shadow Fiend to BKB, then End Lions, if they lose the Rubik in exchange for that, they're just going to back off. They just have to wear this BKB down from the Shadow Fiend, either by killing him off and then completely ignoring it, or by forcing him into popping it in poor situations. Either way, it'll be a nice win for End Lions. So the Blink on Rubik is going to be pretty much the best counter that they have versus the Shadow Fiend. Blink on Tidehunter is kind of the same thing, but a little bit less so because Tidehunter doesn't actually have any hardcore disables, except for a Ravage, which is never really what you want to open up with when the enemy has a BKB. Cleave, they're going to try to sneak a Roshan, but they are going to lose a Tier 2 Tower in exchange. I don't think they were going to defend this Tier 2 Tower anyway, so I guess this could be pretty good for them if they get it and get out quickly, but end lines they push damn fast, and it's going to be a very fast Tier 2 Tower, even through Fortification, and well, Cleave are now going to have to be forced to defend their base. With the Aegis in tow and a Batrider on their team, it's going to be pretty much their largest opportunity. And it's going to have to happen right now because then Lions, they're tired of waiting. They're going to start the chip game right now and Hacken up on the front line is going to lay some fire down onto everyone. But the counter push from Cleave, will it be enough? Uh, they could do very well in clearing the creeps. But end lines, they're just waiting for an opportunity for the Rubik to jump in, for the Tidehunter to jump in. And then Cleave, it's going to be a really hard fight for them. Yeah, it really will. Even without the creeps, Pugna Blast is still going to do significant damage to this tower, so even though the backdoor protection is going to be up through about half of this push, it's still enough to where they can take this slow and steady. Um, both teams are just waiting for something to happen, but now with the Aghanim Scepter on the Razor, they can commit a little bit harder to this. This push would be a lot easier if Ru or, uh, Tide Boys rather, uh, would have picked up his pipe, or had his pipe finished yet. Um, so they might consider backing off uh, for bottom and um, mid before they fully commit, but I think they can still get this tier 3 tower pretty comfortably. I mean, they brought it down to almost half HP without committing anything at all. Like, everyone just stepping back, throwing a liquid fire, and then rinsing, repeating after blasting, stuff like that. But now Hacken does have an angle to jump in. He's going to jump in, but he's instantly going to get obliterated. The Ravage onto everyone from Cleave. Batrider down, stress in the BKB. Does get a pretty nice Requiem, but he can't kill off Phantom with the raises. The Urshaker also taking quite a bit of damage as the Tidehunter going very deep. He will go down before killing anyone else. Cleave, they buy back with their Batrider, and I think they hold somehow. Stress with the Requiem was actually pretty much on point, and everyone else from Cleave was spread out far enough so that N-Lions couldn't do anything huge with the Ravage. So I think you could call that a successful defense from Cleave. I would say that that was pretty successful. The Shadow Fiend, he was the only one that wasn't affected by the Requiem. Um, but yeah, the spread coming out from Cleave, despite everybody getting stunned from the uh, Ravage, they weren't able to commit on any single target. They kind of spread their focus. The Tidehunter dove really deep, and they didn't bring 
anybody down or... Well, they brought down the uh, Batrider, but that was pretty easy anyway, since he jumped into a Pugna Blast, I believe, and then just got dropped down from there. Um, so yeah, it is going to be Northern Lions taking a little bit of a step back as they wait for the next item. Oh no, Earthshaker. He just gets sold up by the Pugna casually before uh, Pugna runs away with the haste rune. Yeah, it's run in, run into a low health Earthshaker who is at like half, blast drain, and then run away. And I mean, Pugna is a pretty fast hero. I don't even think he needed a haste rune for that one, but it just made it all the more comical for him. Earthshaker dying isn't a terribly huge deal, although he's actually remarkably close to his blink dagger. I thought he would be a little bit further away given the fact that Cleave actually haven't gotten many kills, so there's not a whole bunch of you know assist gold that's being raked up for the Earthshaker. It's just all gold that he's been saving up and just slowly acquiring from the few amount of creeps that he's been killing. But if he does get a Blink Dagger up, that could be a huge pickup for Cleave. Echo Slam is a great tool against any sort of team that is going to be going for pushing ever, let alone the End Lion squad. So this Earthshaker, he needs his Blink Dagger, and that death is unfortunately going to slow him down a lot more than I thought. Yeah. Shadow Fiend... His BKB is available and he has the Aegis, so with the Aegis he's going to feel comfortable enough to farm outside of his base pretty aggressively. Usually you're not going to see this, but worst case scenario, he BKB TPs out. Um, he'll probably go back to base after this, and there you go, back to base he goes, without anybody actually coming to commit for that. Um, it's a little bit more room than you usually see, but it's nothing that's going to be unsurmountable for Northern Lions. The Shadow Fiend, I'm not sure what he needs next. Really, it feels like he needs a fully completed next item before he can actually do much. Batrider blinks up top. Not going to find Ingwen. Blink forward by the Rubik. They're going to steal Signia Palm. Um, I don't know, fairly useless, but, you know. Oh, Blink Dagger it's... is completed on your Earthshakers. So this is the big tool that Cleave needed to um, help them out. This is going to make defending high ground a whole lot easier. Okay, so Wind Ranger, I thought, was going to be going for a mech. I feel like if you're going to be landing Wind Ranger on the bottom lane like that, you just have to go for it. A mech would have been huge for Cleave right now. That's another one of the big tools that they are missing. And now Blink BKB on the Shadow Fiend. It's a pretty standard Shadow Fiend build. And I think not going for damage or anything like that is perfectly fine in this situation since you're really going to be playing the defensive and trying to stall this game out. So the Shadow Fiend is more or less prepared for this upcoming fight, but... Cleave, they don't have a mech, whereas end lines they've had a mech for however long. Pugna with the mech is his first item, has had that for quite a long time, and Cleave, they're probably not going to get one at all. They're going to have to prepare for this defense up on top lane, though. They know that the Razor's up there. I don't know if they know if anyone else is up there, but they should know that uh, top lane is going to be the next point of contention. With the Ravage now refreshed from the Tidehunter, and with the Pipe of Insight up, this is going to be uh, end lines going for round two on this top lane, and it's going to be even stronger with that pipe. Assuming Phantom doesn't get completely zoned out again by the Shadow Fiend, he should be fine. Two-man Shackle, that's a nice little opening. His evasion is actually going to focus by the tower. This last launch of evasion, not going to do anything. The Force Staff finally out, but Hacken already dropped pretty low. Now the BKB Requiem is going to hit onto everyone. And Metro is also going to get a pretty nice Echo Slam onto two. Stress in the middle of everything. Just going to town. Tide Boys will land the Ravage onto two, killing off the Wind Ranger. But is that going to be enough? It's so far a two for one. The Wind Ranger forced to buy back. Fortification now is so denying Phantom. This tower kill for now. Stress still on the outskirts of this fight. The tower could get denied, will get denied, and Cleave, they're forced to buy back with their Wind Ranger. I think that might be considered another successful defense. These buybacks are really starting to get expensive, though. First it was the Bat Rider, then the Wind Ranger. If end lines go one more time, then I don't know who else could buy back. Maybe the Shadow Fiend? I suppose so. I think at the end of the day, what matters is that the barracks still stand. They also do a little bit of economic damage with the deny on the tower. Um, but yeah, it's still not a convincing win for either side. Um, Northern Lines are probably going to be okay with this. Um, I'm not sure what waiting is actually going to do. As the buyback on the Wind Ranger, she's now only at 1500 gold, and pretty much any item that Roger picks up is going to do very little to nothing. Unless, like, a completed Scythe of Ice was done, I'm not sure there's anything else that would actually have a significant impact. The mech might be useful even now, at 25 minutes in. It's not the fastest as Roger, he's gonna get linked up and actually takes a lot of damage. Um, didn't expect him to drop that low, but Phantom XP with another haste rune almost finds himself a kill. That's the third haste rune for the Pugna, and he's been using them pretty effectively, almost getting kills every single time. Of course, almost kills don't really mean anything, and they're going to go for bottom lane. Rubik now caught in the net, Earthshaker going to blink in, and the Mystic Flare, that is one dead Magus, and it's going to slow down End Lion's future plays just a little bit. However, Rubik is not really an integral part of their plans. Phantom XP, crucially, has not been ganked a single time from Cleave. Uh, Hacken hasn't found an angle to get himself a lasso on that Pugna, 
And every single time the Pugna doesn't die, he just gets a little bit more. And now they're going to go for stress, forcing out the BKB TP. They're just going to do an okay amount of damage to him before he is out. But that BKB charge is, again, something that the Shadow Fiend is going to be very heavily reliant on. And every single time he pops it in order to escape or in order to do no damage back onto End Lions is a pretty nice win for End Lions, especially since they didn't actually invest anything in popping that BKB. Just Shadow Fiend getting a little bit too overconfident with his survivability. Yeah, Pugna is getting very close to the BKB, and at that point, even if he is lassoed back, they're not going to be able to do enough damage if he pops up before the lasso comes out. Shadow Fiend right-clicking, it's useful, I suppose, um, for bringing down the Pugna, but even that's not going to be enough to bring him down alone. Pugna very liberally using his life drain on creeps. I'm not sure if doing that to lane creeps is actually very useful at all. Um, but either way, he's going to go back to base to complete up his BKB. And then I think it's time for Northern Lions to go for round two of the high ground push. Roshan is going to spawn sooner rather than later. We'll have to see if Jakiro actually falls down and bottom. Another Blink Lasso initiation is going to prove successful at the Skyrath Mage Ultimate. They're finding some pretty good pickoffs. Cleave or... Managing to not fall entirely behind. The gold graph, although it's still very much in the favor of Northern Lions at 12,000, um, and experience also in their favor, they've stemmed the bleeding. It's kind of flatlined coming out from Northern Lions. Roger up on top is going to be in a little bit of trouble. Ingman is unable to cancel this TP, however. Windrun TP is actually pretty legit, especially versus Razor. So, Cleave, they are getting kills with this Batrider every single time his lasso has been up. First it was the Rubik, then it was the Shihiro. If anyone else shows their face in the bottom lane, I'm pretty sure they're also going to die. But uh, Batrider can only depend on this for so long. If Cleave were doing this for the first 20 minutes in this game, like as soon as Batrider got his Blink Dagger, I guess, then they would have been fine in this game. But uh, it's coming out a little bit later. It's always going to be relevant for sure. But is it going to be relevant enough? That's an entirely separate question because end lines are going for round three up on the top lane. Their Ravage is up, the Pipe is up on the Tide Hunter. They're ready to go. And there is a lasso from the Bat Rider. I think he pretty much has to go for Pugna or Bust, but even then, Pugna has a 10 second BKB. And this push from end lines, every single time they go for it, it's just going to be that much stronger. As really the item progression for Cleave has been non existent, I don't think they've picked up a single item. A single substantial item, rather, that is going to help them defend this. Whereas the end lion side, BKB on the Pugna, four staff on the Rubik, they are getting these items up. So, Cleve, these fights are going to be more and more difficult. Bottom lane, there's still an Earthshaker who needs to get back, like, right the hell now because they're going to break the high ground. There's a lasso onto Phantom XP. This time, he will get it off for quite fully, and the Requiem can do no damage, though. Ravage out to everyone, and the Echo Slam also onto Noah because everyone has a BKB up. Stress is the only one alive, but his BKB is going to run out, and now he's going to be whipped down. That's the death of the Shadow Fiend instantly buying back. Power shots off to the side and everything like that, but Cleve have already lost three. Another Shackle attempt. Phantom XP is still alive, has yet to die in this game. And I think that is going to be that, although a nice four-man fissure. I don't know if Cleave could actually put enough damage back in this end line side. They're going to all try to force that themselves out, but Cleave now getting shackled up. And he will be brought down, yes, with the life drain. Ingman going to tank up the entirety of that Mystic Flare, and then now just go to town on the rest of Cleave. The entire top lane of Cleave is going to be left in shambles because they don't have any more tools to defend. End lines with round three, they've finally made it happen. That's going to be the first set of Raxes, and I think it's going to be time to go for a little bit more. Knowing the Shadow Fiend is down, Cleave, they actually just can't make a substantial defense right here. Outside of a beautiful two-man shackle shot into a five-man Echo Slam, it's not going to happen. Echo Slam isn't even up. Fissure is going to wall them off, which is pretty nice. And Fissure has actually stolen as well. However, Wind Ranger dropping pretty low to this Tide Hunter. Tide Boys, in the wrong side of this friendly Rubik's Fissure, is going to pop up the pipe instantly. It will pretty much be uh, dried up, but he will force staff his way down to the low ground. Blink forward for a lasso, trying to bring him back to the high ground, and he will come back into the dire base. You can't just leave, Tide Hunter. But uh, Cleave, though they do get the Tidehunter kill, they lost way too much. They lost the top Raxes, and that's exactly what End Lions wanted to do. They forced out three buybacks, and they got an additional kill on top of that. Nothing but wins for the End Lions side, really. Yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. Earthshaker is going to have his Echo Slam presumably for the next high ground defense. Um, but for Northern Lions, I think it's just pretty straightforward. Go for Roshan, then do it again, or maybe just do it again. Um, as soon as you have your Tidehunter back up, he'll have Ravage. There's an Orchid on the Wind Ranger, but at this point, that's pretty negligible. It's sort of useful up against the Tidehunter. He's the only one that you're going to be silencing that doesn't have a BKB. Um, might be useful against Rubik, but even then, do too much damage to the Tidehunter, it's just going to be cracking off. He's still going to be able to get the Ravage off pretty effectively. This Orchid, it would have been nice if it came out before 20 minutes, but at this point in the game, it's not going to do very much at all. Alright, so Cleave... 
I don't know if there's anything that they can do outside of hope for the miracle fight. Unfortunately, the BKB uh, Requiem was just a little bit too slow to actually kill out the Pugna as he did get the BKB off. And now the Skyrath Mage drained out easy kills. He's in the wrong side of the map. And well, he's near his secret shop. And when that's the wrong side of the map, you know that you're in trouble. But really, the BKB and Pugna coming in big for him in the last fight. And it's still only at nine seconds. That was one usage of the BKB in order to take down one set of Raxes. And the difference between nine, 10, and eight seconds is rather minimal. They are going to go try to go for Roshan against a Batrider. Always an incredibly dangerous feat, especially when the enemy team has a Wind Ranger as well to scout out with power shots. So I don't think End Lions can do this. Uh, they can do this, but they won't be able to do this comfortably. Tideboy's up at the high ground. Was pushed up there from a Flame Break, but he has a Blink Dagger, so he's probably pretty happy with being here. The Rubik's up to the side. He's going to land a Fissure onto Roger. They're still going for this. This is incredibly bold from End Lions, and I think unnecessarily so. They could just go for the push without the Aegis. They're putting themselves at a risk now that they don't really have to take. But they're slowly bringing down Roshan, and there's another Firefly. It will time pretty much at the exact time when they need it to. But now Blink Forward onto the Wind Ranger. They're going to Fissure her up and then Anger Smash her down. That's the death of the Wind Ranger. And now back into the Roshan pit they go. Batrider, I don't know if he could do anything heroic here, although he might certainly be forced to try because at this point you need big plays. He will get his Blink Dagger canceled, though, by the Rubik. He will get hit with the Mystic Flare, but who really cares because he's just saved the... The Aegis for his Razor by doing that little play. So, little plays from the Rubik, and it's going to ensure the Aegis for the End Lions team. Shadowfiend took a tier 1 tower while that was happening. Going to be completely irrelevant in this game as End Lions, now with the Aegis and all of their item advantage and gold advantage, they're going to be fine to go for the next push. Whether it's mid lane or bottom lane, I don't really think it matters because they are so farmed and they have so much pushing power still. I think it'll be. Just mid, unless they feel the need to counter push this Earthshaker. Earthshaker's gonna put a little bit of pressure, maybe on the tier two, but it doesn't matter. Um, let's see. Heart is going to be next choice for the Razor and Tide Hunter. I think that's his completed refresh. No, 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 not even. It's just like a TP. Nothing very substantial for the Tide Hunter. Um, but yeah, we're just going to see the slow push coming out from Northern Lions yet again. They're going to clear up the creep wave, then they're going to liquid fire and Pugna blast the tower. Firefly is going to be a little bit annoying. They also have power shot spam, but they can still put some decent damage on this tower. Ice path attempt by the Jakiro going to miss, but the liquid fire is going to hit, and slowly but surely, this tier three tower is going to fall. So, Cleave, they have to make something happen right now. Wind Ranger, her job right now is to keep throwing out Shackle Shots and try to hope for a two-man. Ideally, it would be on the Pugna in some manner, but landing those two-man Shackle Shots at all is going to be an extremely hard challenge for her. So, if she does get it together, then Cleave are going to be able to take a fight on their terms, and that's pretty nice. If not, then it'll just be constant chip damage from the Jakiro, from the Pugna, and then Cleave are going to end up losing everything. Ingman, she's going to bust up the high ground. He doesn't care. He has an Aegis as well as a Reaver. He's going to go to town on the Mailer Axes, and now what are Cleave going to do? The Lasso is not going to be really successful as he gets obliterated. Now the Requiem is going to connect only onto BKBs, and the Skyrath Mage is going to go down. Stress is completely on the run, stealing so much damage out from him. He's going to get whipped down probably by the Razor, while the rest of End Lions are very comfortably taking down the Raxes. Cleave, they've lost three. They haven't gained a single thing, and they lo lose their initiation in the Batrider. This has got to be GG. The Wind Ranger is also going to go down. Only the Earthshaker with an Echo Slam is left. Even if he lands it onto all five of these heroes right now, they're going to shrug it off really easily. This is going to be Mega Creeps. Yep. I don't know. They're probably just hoping for the Earthshaker amazing Echo Slam, but for all intents and purposes, this is probably the end of it. It is also a best of one, so GGing out is... I don't know, it's, it's fine here in this situation. Cleave are going to call it and as well as disconnect, so that's going to be the end of it, I think, um, for this series. I'm pretty sure we have other series going on in Heffley TV too, and potentially on Twitch.tv slash Um But yeah, well played. A well executed early game coming out um, from the Northern Lions to push into a win. Um, there just wasn't very much that um, Cleave could do at the end of that, where their early landing stage was very passive. They allowed Northern Lions to Get away with the Pugna that didn't die a single time that game. That's just not how you deal with the Pugna. Yeah, you gotta make sure to pressure him, much like a tinker. If you let the Pugna get everything he wants, then most likely you're going to regret it. But uh, yeah, as you said, there are other games going on right now. We will check, and in a little bit we'll update the screens as to tell you guys what's actually happening. If there's going to be more Dota on this channel, or if you're going to have to move somewhere else for the Dota, we're just going to host over there. So you actually won't have to move anywhere, but uh, it'll just be on the waiting screen. We'll let you know there. But that's going to be it. Northern Lions, they break the tie with a victory. So, a pretty easy one as well. I mean, Pugna 9011, not bad. Yeah, definitely not. Our next game here is going to be in about two hours. Um, 
yeah, so in the meantime, we'll probably just host you over to Heplo TV too. After a little bit of music and ads, then the stream will close down. So thanks for watching and.